Please take your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 7. Good intentions are only wishful thinking without follow through. In 538 BC, 48 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, 70 years after the first Jewish deportation to Babylon, a large caravan of returning exiles came back to the site of Jerusalem. It was a pile of rubble. There was no city there. There were just ruins. And greeted, greeted with nothing but rubble and hostile neighbors, those folks eagerly came with the hopes of restoring the worship God had prescribed at Mount Sinai back there in Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Their fellow Jews back in Babylon had given generously to make it all happen. They had, authorized, they had authorization from the king of Persia himself. And all should go according to plan. And yet starting well is no guarantee of success. We have seen the conditions by the time Nehemiah arrived when we started that series. And arriving on the scene, when Nehemiah showed up and he does his, his survey going around there, uh, that was 93 years after the destruction of Jerusalem or 93 years, rather, after, after the first uh, folks had returned. So what had happened in the meantime? You had over 40,000 people show up to rebuild the temple. They had authorization. They were coming to, there were virtually no Jews left in the land. They came back to repopulate the province, to restore worship. What, what had happened? What had started out so well with so many good intentions? How was it that when Nehemiah came, you had such a deplorable situation? What, what happened in the meantime? What happened to those, those first well-intentioned returnees? Well, let's look at what brought this question to Nehemiah. In chapter one, or chapter seven, rather, in verse one, it says, now it came to pass when the wall was built, okay, they'd already finished that, to God be the glory. The wall was finished. It says there in, uh, in 52 days there back in verse 15 of the previous chapter. They had finished up. He'd set up the doors, the porters, the singers, the Levites were appointed. The worship was all in place to be using that temple that was there now within walls. And I gave my brother Hanani, this is the fellow who brought the news to Nehemiah all the way over in Persia at the very beginning of the book. The circumstances there, he appointed his brother Hanani, and another guy named Hananiah, don't get those two confused, uh, the ruler of the palace, the fortress. He gave these two guys charge over Jerusalem, for he was a faithful man and feared God above many. And he said, let not the gates of, the, of Jerusalem be open until the sun is hot. We don't want to be, remember, they were dealing with hostile neighbors. There was the threat of invasion. There was the threat of, of, uh, of uh, military action. And so we want to wait, uh, not wet sunrise, but let's wait until uh, close to closer to lunchtime before we, uh, before we open the gates. By the way, lunchtime, we have lots of sandwiches out there. Grab something on your way out. If you're feeling a little peckish while you're here, feel free to go out and get yourself a sandwich. Make sure you come back in. <laughs> and, uh, and so the, everything is in place. The walls have been rebuilt. He appointed the watches of Jerusalem. Everyone with his watch. Everyone was to be over against his house. The few houses that were there, uh, mostly of the, of the priests and so on. He says now in verse 4, now this is a key thing. Now remember, the circumference of the walls was between a mile and a half and two and a half miles. That's a, that's a decent piece of real estate. And ancient cities, once you were inside the walls, things were tight and crowded. Um, some of you maybe have been overseas and been to, to some of these really ancient uh, places, and it's tight and it's crowded. If you go to uh, the old part of San Francisco, it's the same way. Parts of New York City are that way. It's tight and crowded. Uh, real estate is at a premium. There's little bits of Seattle that are like that. The lots are little. You could put, in pl there's places in Seattle where you probably put three houses in a lot the size of this auditorium. Uh, things are tight and crowded, and the reason is because there's only so much space within the walls. But in this particular place, it says the, in Jerusalem at this time, the city was large and great. This, this great big huge thing, mile and a half, two and a half miles in, in, uh, per, with the perimeter. But it says the people were few therein and the houses were not yet built. You've got the, it's basically a giant corral 
There's nothing, you could, you could graze sheep inside this thing. You have the temple over here. Remember, the temple is not that big. The temple, as far as square footage and so on, is smaller than this room. The temple's not a real big building. And you have a number of priest's houses, and that's probably it. You've got the wall, and then you've got a lot of empty space. And yet Jerusalem is the capital. Jerusalem is the place of, of worship. Jerusalem is the, is the centerpiece for Judaism. And there's no one there. There's no one there. And the people had come from all the, the other cities and villages that were now fully inhabited. And they had come and built the walls and then gone back home. Well, what happened 93 years before? These folks came with the intention of rebuilding the temple and reestablishing life in Judea as it had been. What happened? Almost 100 years have gone by. You would think something had ha would uh, have been accomplished. Nehemiah shows up, and what does he find? He finds ruins and rubble. He says in verse 5, And my God put into my heart to gather together the nobles and the rulers and the people, that they might be reckoned by genealogy. And I found a register of the genealogy of them that came up at the first and found written therein. Now, we're not going to read through this whole thing because we have like 70 verses of lists of names. Okay? Not going to do that. But we will talk about a few things along the way. But here's the thing. You've got, when it's all said and done, a huge crowd of people. 93 years have passed. The descendants of these people, the grandchildren of these people, are there. They are the ones that built the wall. Their grandparents had come with great enthusiasm. These folks had go, were going back, most of them, to a place they had only heard of. There were a few of the old timers that were there before, but very few. And there would be nothing there and nobody to greet them, at least not folks that were eager to have them there. And they returned with a purpose. At the very end of the book of, you don't have to turn there, but the very end of the book of 2 Chronicles and the very beginning of the book of Ezra, that you have the, the same phrasing. I mean, it's almost a repeat, uh, word for word. We have a decree by Cyrus, and I'm going to read the passage from Ezra chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. Now, in the first, now, this is 93 years plus before, before the time of Nehemiah. Now, in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, this is the fellow who conquered Babylon that we have recorded there in Daniel chapter 5. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, that the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled, the Lord stirred up by the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, and he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, Thus saith Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth, the Persian Empire went from Pakistan to Libya. It was huge. And he hath charged me to build him a house at Jerusalem, which is in Judea. Who is there among you of all his people? His God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and build the house of the Lord God of Israel. He is the God, which is at Jerusalem. And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of that place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the freewill offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. So the goal is to restore the worship that God had decreed by the law of Moses. And you have the great intentions of, of those that, that went. You will have 42,360 men. This does not include the, the, the women and children. 40. 2,360 people returned, walking or riding donkeys and so on, uh, from Babylon to Judea, a trip of probably 700 miles or more. And they left everything behind. There, were, there was money given to them. There, were, there was livestock given to them. There were resources given to these folks by the people that remained behind there in Babylon to help them on their way. And they went. They went with a lot of stuff. Uh, in verses 68 through 73, it talks about their livestock, the stuff that they, uh, they took. 736 horses, 243 mules, 435 camels, and 6,720 donkeys. That would be the Chevrolet of the day. And with this group, you had 4,289 priests. They were ready to go. 
They had uh, a bunch of the, the, the garments ready, the, the, uh, the tools, the, the cups, the bowls, the, all the different things that were necessary for the temple worship that Babylon had, or that Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon had carried away. They were given back to the Jews. They took them back to, uh, to Judea. They were going back with the best of intentions. In verse uh, 4 of Nehemiah, or Ezra chapter 1, it says, And whosoever remaineth in any place where he sojourneth, let the men of his place help him with silver and with gold and with goods and with beasts, besides the free will offerings for the house of God that is in Jerusalem. They had the donation by the governor. They had the donations by the, the nobles, by the common people. Here's the total of the money that came in. It was 41,000 gold drachmas. Wow, is that impressive? Okay, let's put that. That's 697 pounds of gold. Uh, we're talking well over $12 million in gold. They were given 4,200 silver minas, which is 6,138 pounds of silver. Again, coming to over $2 million. They were given 50 basins of gold, 597 priest garment. Now, I understand that, that we think, well, it's just clothes. Up until 150 years ago or so, all clothes were hand-woven and hand-sewn. You know, thank Mr. Singer, all right? Uh, and so clothes were expensive. And you didn't have a lot of, you know, I, 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 what am I going to wear today? Well, you got one or two options. And the priest's garments had all kinds of intricate uh, uh, things added to them. And so these are expensive. 597 priest's garments, all handmade. And all this stuff is over and above their, their personal belongings. So all this stuff they are taking back with them. And they came for worship. Look at verse 73 here in chapter 7. It says, So the priests and the Levites and the porters and the singers and some of the people, and of the Nethanim, and all Israel dwelt in their cities. And when the seventh month came, the children of Israel were in their cities. All these folks came back. They came back and they moved to the little towns where their grandparents had lived. And a few of the old timers walked back into maybe even the same house, or at least the, the, the foundation and so on, of the house that they had lived in when they were young. They come back, they arrive, they disperse, they go to their towns. And what do they do when they're in those towns? Well, we, we read about that in the, in the reading that we did with Haggai. They built their own houses. Now, granted, I've got to have a place to live. I've got to have a place to live. But understand, where did Israel live during the wilderness wanderings? Where did they live when they were traveling from Babylon to Judea? They lived in tents. A lot of you like going camping. Me, I don't like to live on the ground. I don't want to sleep on the ground. But a lot of you like to go camping. That's good for you. Glad you like that. Tents. I've done that. And these folks had done that too. But when they arrive, their purpose is not to build their little cities. Their purpose is to rebuild the temple. The first and foremost thing they need to do, and this is what they were told by the king, and this is what they told the folks at home, and this is why they gave, was to reestablish temple worship. So what do we have to do? We have to build a temple. And the king had authorized the lumber. He had authorized the access to the stone. He had done everything necessary and made it. Then it was a donation made. So that all these things could happen. And the folks get there. Again, including women and children, over 100,000 people. This great, huge migration. And they come and they scatter their little towns. And that's the end of it. Nothing happened. They built their own houses. And they resumed life as they had done in Babylon. They brought their trades with them, and they began to trade with their other little villages that had all just moved there. Take, we're going to take all this bunch of people, and we're going to move them over here, and nothing changes other than the location. They neglected their initial purpose. In Haggai chapter 1, verse 2, it says, This people say the time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Because after all, we've come back, and we've got a lot of pocket money. We were given all this livestock, we were given all this money, and we have come back, 
and we are going to live high and we're starting from scratch. Things are not good where we arrive, but we're going to build our houses and we've got money and we're going to reestablish things as they were. And they tried to do that. And as Haggai says, things didn't turn out real well. They, all, with all their labors, they, they just couldn't make enough to, to get by with. I mean, it was enough to eat, but barely. They were, they were never satisfied. There was never quite enough. And God told them through the prophet that, hey, wait a minute, the problem is not your labor. The problem is your focus. Do what you're supposed to be doing, and I'll take care of you. You take care of me first, I'll make sure that you're taken care of. And also, Zechariah preached basically the same message. They had neglected their purpose. And so they began the second year, according to Ezra chapter 3 and verse 8, to build the temple. And it was going to be a long, long process with, with a number of breaks in it. They, they put down the cornerstone. They cleared the site, they put the cornerstone in place, and they resumed the offerings. They had the altar in place just with the cornerstone there, and they had a great celebration. And then everybody went home. Because the Samaritans, these same people that wasn't the same character, but the same people, the same uh, ethnic group and so on that had put a stop to, uh, it was trying to hinder the work that Nehemiah was doing, tried to stop the building of the temple. Between the laying of the foundation and the building of the walls of the temple was 16 years. A huge gap. Now, we'll say this, there were some priests there, they had the altar in place, the sacrifices were happening, but you had a big block of stone sitting over here and an altar, and that was all you had. But I've got an authorization from the king. And, but we are intimidated by the people around us. And so I'm going to be, I'll come to Jerusalem for the feasts. I will come for my, my sacrifices and so on. But I will go back to my village wherever I may happen to live. Because there were walls around the villages. They had built the houses in the villages. They had their fields prepped and plowed and planted around the villages. They had their livestock grazing around the villages. But Jerusalem is a place we go to three times a year. And we take our lamb with us, and we perform sacrifice, and then we leave. And yes, there's only a cornerstone there, and yes, there's an altar there, and yes, there's a few huts and small houses here, but there's no walls. This is the site of Jerusalem, but Jerusalem as a city does not exist. I'm too busy. I'm doing other things. And so 16 years lapsed between the laying of that cornerstone and the building of the walls of Jerusalem. And there would be further delay, 23 years from their arrival until they completed the temple, according to Ezra chapter 6 and verse 15. 23 years to build a building roughly the size of this room. And it's not like it's got, you got to run wiring or plumbing. You have stone walls and you have a stone slab foundation. They had already cleared that when they put the cornerstone down. It took them that long, you build the walls, you have cross pieces of the lumber that they had authorization from the crown to get, and then you put a tile roof on top of it. And this was not an elaborate temple. Don't think of this as being a reproduction of what Solomon had built hundreds of years before. This is something very basic, same floor plan, roughly the same dimensions, but very, very basic. It's a big box with two rooms, and that's it. And yet it took them 20 three years to finish the job. Part of it was due to opposition, but the primary reason was their own drag, dragging their own feet. I've got a job to do for God. Yeah, I know, but I've got this, and I've got this, and I've got this. They had neglected to do the most important thing. They had failed to fulfill their purpose. Why did I leave Babylon? Why did I come to Judea? Why did we gather together here at the site of Jerusalem, this huge pile of, of burnt stone? Why did we come here? Well, the crown says, my, my authorization from the king says we're here to rebuild the temple. But what happened? Well, I built my own house, and I put a wall around my little village, and I plowed my field, and I restarted my business, and I did this, and I did this, and I did this. Yes, but what did you do in Jerusalem? Well, 
we, we, we cut one stone and we put it in place over there. And then we built an altar and we offered sacrifices and we had a great time of celebration. And then we went home. But I thought you guys just traveled for a number of months to come and rebuild the temple because this was why you left. This is why people donated. This is why you uprooted yourself from Babylon and came all the way here. What happened? We easily get distracted. Sometimes the distraction, and we've seen this with Nehemiah, that would take place 93 years later. We get distracted by finances, financial trouble. We get distracted by opposition. We get distracted by danger. We get distracted by a whole host of things. Sometimes our own selves, sometimes other things without. But we get distracted. It's amazing. One person, author of our, our book, Nehemiah, you have one person who comes, and he has a commission, just like the folks did 93 years before. He has authorization, just like the folks did 93 years before. He has the materials that have been given to him, just like the folks 93 years before. All the resources are there, just like the folks 93 years before. Ninety-three years have passed, and Nehemiah does in months what other folks had not done in 93 years. What was the difference? Nehemiah refused to be distracted. Nehemiah refused to be sidetracked. Folks, we get sidetracked. I've mentioned repeatedly, this is my pet peeve of the last two years. We have been sidetracked by politics, and we have been sidetracked by the plague. You can alliterate it, okay? Politics and plague. And I get together with, with, with other preachers for a preacher's meeting this spring, and I'm hearing all the woes that these guys are dealing with. Yes, we are dealing with a problem with the, uh, the plague. Yes, people are getting sick. Yes, every hand went up as far as the preachers saying, yes, it, I've lost at least one person in my congregation because of this thing. Every preacher raised their hand. But what about now? Because by that time, most of this had, had gone by. Things had loosened up a little bit. The worst of it was past. What was going on now? Well, how, 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 mu how many of your people, how, what percentage of your, your pre-plague congregation are you, do you have? Oh, on a good Sunday, we've got about 40%. Well, do you, have you instituted a, uh, a streaming thing? Have you done the online thing? Well, some had and some hadn't. Why not? Well... I don't know how to do this, or, or the person who was supposed to do it got sight. Folks, we got distracted. And one of the amazing things is that there were a handful of churches, by the way, praise the Lord, our church was one of them. There was a handful of churches that had actually managed to survive this thing with their numbers intact and had actually maybe even grown. And we were one of the very few of that in that category. What was the problem? Folks got distracted. Circumstances do not change what God has commissioned us to do. Circumstances do not change what God has given to us in the Great Commission. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, make disciples, go out and share the gospel. Now, I may have to change my tactic a little bit. What, I, pardon me for laughing. There was a church, I won't even say what city it was in, that were saying, you know, we've, we've continued our door-to-door -door evangelism, but we're not being well-received during this time. Well, go figure. <laughs> you refuse to wear a mask, and you're knocking on the door of strangers, and you expect them to open the door and greet you and welcome you in and so you can share the gospel. Folks, change your tactic a little bit. 
try something a little different, but continue to do what God has called you to do. Knocking on doors is not the only thing that God has told us to do. There's lots of ways of sharing the gospel. Just do it. Adjust your, 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 your focus a little bit. Adjust your technique. Adjust your method a little bit. But continue to do what God has called you to do. Instead, we've got a bunch of people sitting at home watching television, per, uh, perusing Facebook and doing anything else they can do to distract themselves because they're bored. And instead of doing what God would have them to do, they're living a year-long vacation. It didn't change. Our job for God did not change. We may have had to make some adjustments as far as how we're doing it. I'll tell you what, this stuff, the camera stuff, I, I love being in show business now. It's just wonderful. <laughs> we should have been doing this years ago. This has actually turned out to be a great blessing. And I've mentioned this a number of times. That something that we should have been doing, we were forced to do because of the circumstances. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. We have people, used to be part of Grace Baptist Church years ago, that are watching because their church is closed, or maybe there isn't a church where they are. I've got folks in Wisconsin, and North Carolina, and Texas, and California, and Oregon, and Japan, and Korea, and India watching us. Could we have done that two years ago? Nope. God has turned what the world sees as some horrible tragedy into a tremendous blessing. Because the liberals that don't have any message, that don't preach the gospel, most of them aren't, aren't doing this. Their people aren't doing anything. And so they go home, and they, but they still want to, some of them still want to do church. So they're, they're going online and stuff, and they find something. <clears throat> and the vast majority of churches that are doing an online presence are at least preaching the gospel. And people have been saved through this. And then you have folks in different parts of the world that don't have access to Bible training. A fellow's trying to pastor a, a little church. He's got no formal training. He got saved. He's the best qualified guy in his church to be the preacher. But he's got a computer. And he can go online and find somebody that's preaching the same thing that he's preaching and find out what he says and, 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 and what this guy says and what this guy says. And the guy is able to get some, some, some instruction so that he can turn around and teach his people. What a blessed thing. They're, they don't have an opportunity for, to go to seminary or to go to college, but they have that opportunity. And you know what? Two years ago, that wasn't available either for the most part. God has turned tragedy into blessing. What was me? Oh, I, 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 I can't do that. Folks, we got distracted. And so many churches drop the ball and stop doing what they're supposed to be doing, either because of fear of knowing how to do it, or an unwillingness to ask for help, or they're just terrified because of the plague. I have a, a friend who's a pastor in another state, and he says that the churches, especially in the big cities, even though things are open, are terrified to go back to the church. There's some of them are still only running 40%. That's a tragedy. That's a tragedy. Folks, we need to be busy doing what God has called us to do. We are to assemble together. Take the precautions. I'm, I'm, I'm not a no vax kind of guy. I'm probably going to make some enemies with that too. Take the precautions, but be in church. Be with God's people. At least listen online if you've got a, a compromised health situation, but be faithful to the Lord. Be faithful in his word. And be faithful in sharing the gospel with other people. You can do it over the phone. You can mail something to somebody. Email them, text them, do something. But just because we're going through trying times does not mean that I, I, I can get to set the Great Commission on the shelf and abandon it. I am to be busy doing what God has called me to do. And I think in so many ways, we reflect this first generation that went back to Judea. Yes, I've got great intentions. Yes, I have a commission. I know what I'm supposed to be doing. I know where I'm supposed to be going. I know what I'm, what I'm supposed to do once I get there. And when I get there, we start. We get the stone in place. We've cleared the site. We have sacrifices. We've got the altar in place. The priests are in their outfits. They're doing what they're supposed to be doing. We have a big celebration, and that's it. And it never went any further for 93 years. And one guy with a vision... One guy who refuses to be distracted 
in a matter of months, does what should have been done 93 years before. Because what we're going to see here, why does he go back and, and why do you have this long list here? And by the way, the list is also recorded in Ezra. There's a reason this is important. Because we get a little bit further into Nehemiah, and Nehemiah is going to say, all right, folks, Jerusalem has to be built. We've got to have people here. Instead of having a giant sheep pasture, we need to have a city here. And you guys are all out in your villages, all doing your thing, and you've rebuilt your homes and your businesses and everything else. But what we're going to do is I'm going to take volunteers first. And after that, it's going to be one out of ten of you is going to move to Jerusalem. We're going to draw lots, and you're going to move here. And he did that. He took the bull by the horns, and he made sure that what he was supposed to do got done. Is it going to ruffle feathers? It's going to ruffle some feathers. Is it going to make some people feel uncomfortable? It's going to make some people feel uncomfortable. Are people going to be angry? Some people are going to be angry. But when it was all said and done, you had the temple in place, you had the priests officiating, they were dutifully doing all of the things that were required by the law of Moses, as far as the feasts and the sacrifices and things were concerned, and the city was full of people. Jerusalem was no longer a reproach. And when they built, rebuilt the temple, the folks that were first there were just going through the motions. It was a pretentious religion. They were certainly doing better than their forebears did. But they were busy about doing. It was all about doing the, the minutia rather than being, the right to, being what they were supposed to be and having the right devotion. But God gave, gave them a second chance. And God has given us a second chance. We are still here. We have a building. We have tools. And we're doing some things we weren't doing before. And I say this to all the churches that, that, that are in the area, or that are around the world, frankly, that we need to be busy doing what God has called us to do. We have, in some ways, and this is one of the things that was reported by, uh, that I, I was hearing as well, that this has actually created a lot of opportunities. Because a lot of people are scared to death. And when people are scared to death, they are thinking, why are they scared? Because they're afraid of dying. I'm afraid regarding my own mortality. I'm afraid of where I might be for eternity. I'm afraid of ever facing God. And it creates opportunities for the gospel. We need to make sure that we don't make ourselves obnoxious when we do this. Again, knocking on the door without a mask. Hi, I'm a stranger here to breathe on you. There are ways to do it. Be inventive. But make sure that we do the job that God has called us to do. And so there was a second chance. And it was successful. What will they do with the second chance? Nehemiah's purpose was to rebuild the city. Last week we saw the completion of the walls, but that's only the first step. And he is taking the list of all the names, all these, uh, this is a long chapter, 73 verses in this chapter, but it's a list of names. Okay, I'm, I've got the list here. This list was, was written 93 years before. I'm going to find out who their grandkids are. I'm going to make sure I've got a list of everybody. I'm going to update it, and then we're going to go to work with the people that I've got, and we're going to make it happen. I'm going to rebuild this city. Good starts are no guarantee of success. The enthusiasm you had in the early days of your salvation, look back at when you first got saved. Oh, you were excited. You couldn't wait to get to church. You loved to be with God's people. You loved to sing the songs. You, you carried gospel tracts with you. You wanted to hand those out to people. You, it was what you talked about. You were, fly, you were just floating on cloud, line, cloud nine. You were, just, you were just walking along, and if somebody started to talk to you, you wouldn't want to tell them what happened to you. You wanted to share the gospel. You wanted to share your testimony. It was just, you were just so excited. But that early enthusiasm almost always deteriorates over time. We get, we get distracted. We've been distracted. We've been discouraged. We've faced opposition. And we have allowed that to stop us. But thankfully, we serve a God of the second chance. And with determination and a refusal to be distracted, with our focus on the, on the task that God has called us to do, 
the task will get done. Jerusalem gets built. Jerusalem gets inhabited in a matter of months because one guy, just one guy, refused to get distracted. Heavenly Father, thank you for the testimony of one. And so often it only takes one. Father, most people go with the crowd. But if you have one that bucks the trend, who insists on doing what's right, sometimes he'll, he'll gain a following. Sometimes he can motivate others to, to go with him and help. And Nehemiah had that, that talent. And Nehemiah did that. And so, Father, may we be faithful in the task that you have called us to do. May we refuse to get distracted. There's always things to distract us. We've dealt with a, a year and a half of distraction, big time. But Father, I pray that we'd be focused on the task that you called us to do so many years ago. That does not change. And Father, may we be faithful to the task. We pray for Christ's sake. Amen. Let's stand, please.